So as folks are joining, we're just kind of touching base and checking in on what is already here tonight. So we're going to be covering and checking in on creating inner space, which I think is enormously needed in this moment. I think it feels to me at least that anything is possible if we have a little bit of space, if we have a little bit of capacity to make room around our experience. Um, and I want to welcome people to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, maybe we even have some people here for the first time. Um, and if that is the case, then I want to welcome you to a what is, I would say, um, in some ways, kind of a revolutionary model for a Dharma center. And that is a Dharma center not run by teachers like myself, it is run by volunteers and folks who've come together and decided that uh, indeed, the Buddha of the future is the Sangha. And if that is the case, if indeed our teachings are really coming from our community, then let's have the community guide the teachings. So that's what we are all here for as a reminder and what we are here uh, as a result of. So I'm Eve Ekman, one part of the Well of Being. Uh, we will be joined by Lopan Chandra Easton this evening um, to cover our ongoing series. You guys, we're almost done with this book. I don't know if those of you who remember when we covered the Guide to the Bodhisattva um, Way of Life by Shanti Deva, and it took forever. Like each chapter was eons. This thing has flown by, and I'm really going to miss it. It has been such a lovely companion text. Um, and yes, glad to know it will be around. This is the third time I read it as we are reading it together. Um, and definitely the richest time to be sharing it with you all. Uh, Sukhni Rinpoche is a teacher coming from a Tibetan Buddhist lineage. And this book and this chapter this evening um, really provide just simple instructions on how do we move through the process of developing our meditation practice. So not really, you know, not just having some ability to feel okay amid things being hard, but to actually take it to the next step of our practice and to find what he says, a reconnection to our birthright, to our inner spark, to a sense of warmth and clarity and openness. And openness is really woven throughout each of the chapters that we've covered through so far. Because this sense of openness, this sense of spaciousness, it's just, it's freedom. It's total freedom to have a little bit of that sense of openness around our anger, our impatience, our grappling. Um, it really provides us a little bit of respite, not so that we just accept things as they are, but so that we can sustain ourselves in this ongoing journey, in this ongoing um, endeavor to, yeah, change the world we live in, transform what is around us and make it truly a place that reflects one of compassion, um, one of understanding. That's our goal and we need a lot of tools to do so. Um, I would like to say now more than ever, but let's be real, it hasn't been easy for a long time. Um, and I do think keeping that in mind that um, for, uh, especially for a lot of folks, depending on their embodied and lived experiences, it's not as though there was a time before COVID when things were just easy and there wasn't struggle. Um, and for many of us with mental health or substance use challenges or challenging families, we're just in this ongoing, amazing training camp of life that's helping us develop these tools and skills. So tonight, I'll just give you a, a tiny bit more uh, guidance towards our goals here together. And then we'll go ahead and do a practice that honestly is my very favorite practice. And this is a settling the mind into its natural state. For some people, this practice uh, can be a bit, um, a bit vague or confusing. So I just want to front load by saying it's really as simple as it sounds in the instructions. It really is trying to bring your mind and attention back over and over to watching the space of your mind. Settling the mind in its natural state means really paying attention to the gaps in between our thoughts and our feelings. Um, so one thing it's important to mention as our, our intention for being here together tonight is that when we come here together as a, a Dharma space, we come here together with a, a set of shared values and guidelines. 
I am not going to show the PowerPoint tonight because I've um, looked at too many screens today, as probably many of you have. So I'll just give you the verbal guidance. I really invite you in this time that we share together to, as much as possible, adhere to a sense of real showing up as though we were in person. And that includes, if possible, to keep your camera on. You can, if you are really tired, maybe put it inside you. If you are totally spent and you've been doing tons of work and what you really need to do is make linguine and just listen to this talk in the background, I support you. But please do so consciously and intentionally. If you're gonna be here really showing up, do so fully. Um, and if you're with us listening halfway, we welcome you uh, any way that you can come. And just to say that the Dharma Collective is a space in which we really want to live the values of the Dharma. And the values of the Dharma are those of true equality uh, and radical equality, recognizing that there are many ways in this world perpetuates injustice. And that when we're here together, we can try just through paying attention to the movements of our mind, understand where injustice starts, where our judgments towards ourselves or others may arise. And I invite you to, with the real spirit of non-aggression and non-harming, really hold yourself accountable to some of the judgments or projections you may find in your mind, you may find when you're even watching your own meditation or listening to or reading what someone else says. So you really adhere to this core value of non-harming and of transformation, making this world truly a more compassionate world. We, when we think of well-being, when we think of being happy, the goal that most of us are seeking, that includes common humanity. It includes all of us. We can't have our well-being separate from the well-being of everyone. So for us to remind ourselves that in working in community together, being here in Sangha, in this online format, we get to practice that a little, see what it's like to be here together. And um, importantly, everybody has gotten pretty good on Zoom these days, um, but I invite your patience in, in this somewhat challenging format that we are all enduring um, longer and longer amount of time. And if somebody accidentally unmutes, or if a, a cat runs through meowing, as he is likely to do once again, that we just, you know, have some ease with what's happening. And of course, to bring our joyful enthusiasm. We are here together in order to learn, in order to grow, and in order to develop. How awesome. How truly, truly awesome. So with that, I invite you to find a comfortable posture. And by comfortable, I mean one that really supports these qualities of having a sense of uprightness. As Sukhni says, as though you were sitting in your throne with that kind of dignity, with that kind of presence. And while you have this dignity and this presence, you feel that uprightness through the spine, you're also inviting this ease, this relaxation through the entire front of the body. If it's comfortable, I invite you to just gently soften and close the eyelids. And take a moment to possibly inhale your shoulders up to your ears and then exhale them down your back, giving yourself a bit more space and repeating that twice more, inhaling up and exhaling back. One more time. Finding the slight lift of the chest pointing upwards. finding a place where your hands can comfortably rest. That could be on the thighs or folded in your lap. In this practice, especially the practice of settling the mind, stillness is so important. The stillness of our body helping us find the stillness of our awareness.
And then notice where your gaze, even with eyes closed, is pointed. Making sure the head is resting evenly on top of the neck. Let's begin by noticing what's already here in terms of sensations in the body. What does it feel like throughout the muscles in the face? Noticing areas of energy, noticing areas of tension or weight. And notice sensation around the back of the head, the neck and shoulders. Without trying to change or fix anything, if possible, without preference. Notice the experience of sensation through the chest and the belly. We continue this embodied investigation throughout the back, the buttocks, the thighs, the calves, the shins, the feet, through the shoulders, the biceps, the arms, and the hands. And then noticing the body as an entire field of sensation. What is it like to feel the body from within the body? What is here right now? with a sense of awe and wonderment, as though it were the first time you were embodied. Keep allowing yourself to feel through the experience of being in this body. No need for words, no needs for concepts. And from this place of embodied knowing, embodied experiencing, consider what is your intention for being here this evening?
This can be a simple word such as grounding or peace, or it can be a phrase. I want to be together, or I want to learn more, or I want to let go of. Take a couple moments and really allow the intention to surface and reveal itself. And find a single word or phrase and settle with that, repeating it softly to yourself without words, an internal message. And gently release this intention and bring yourself instead back to the field of the body. But this time, focusing on the sensation of breath at the belly. As you inhale, noticing the belly gently rising. And as you exhale, noticing the belly as it slowly deflates. Of course, other thoughts, memories, and images arise. Just gently relax, release, and return. Relax around whatever has captured your attention, then release it. And then return joyfully, slowly developing your meta-awareness, learning how to come back breath by breath by breath. Fully bringing your mindfulness here to the breath and noticing the belly rising and falling. At this moment, there is nowhere else to be, nothing else to do. Inviting your body, your speech, and your mind to settle. And fully give yourself to this simple practice of noticing the breath.
If you find your mind so busy, so full, bring a bit more attention to the exhale and relaxing. If you find your mind so tired and weary, bring a bit more attention to the inhale, inviting the quality of vividness. And continue for just a bit longer, harnessing the full force of our mindfulness to the gentle inhale and exhale as can be experienced at the belly. And we'll gently shift and narrow the focus to the sensation of breath at the nostrils. Noticing the coolness of breath traveling in and the warmth of breath traveling out. Let the breath be natural. And let the face be soft, not focusing too tightly around the nostrils. Feeling softness through the eyes, softness through the brow, softness through the jaw. And now gently and softly open the eyelids just a bit, letting your gaze be softly focused in front of you. No particular area of focus. And let the focus now of your mindfulness be to the thoughts and the gaps and spaces between them. The first thought might be, am I doing this right? Notice as that thought arises, notice where it arose from, notice what remains when it passes. In this way, we open completely to the thoughts, the memories, the images, which arise and fall within the space of the mind. See if you can notice the particular quality of stillness of your awareness, even as these thoughts, memories, and images move through. And continue with this practice, being stillness within movement, noticing but not engaging with thoughts, memories, and images as they arise and pass away. even a tiny glimpse of space between the thoughts gives us an entire view of openness, spaciousness.
Feel as though you were leaning back in your mind, resting in the spacious awareness, watching as what might feel like many or may feel like few thoughts are arising, presenting themselves and then passing away back into the awareness from which they arose. Notice how some thoughts arise and pass away easily and others gain more of our attention. Keep coming back to the space of awareness, releasing and releasing and releasing the thoughts, memories, and images, the full stream of mental events. Gently lower the eyelids. Regather the attention inward to the body. Returning to that experience of feeling the entire body as a field of tactile sensation. Again, noticing what's here in the body. What has shifted or changed? What has remained the same? Bring forth a quality of kindness and gentleness in this noticing of the body. Welcoming, maybe even appreciating whatever is here.
Thank you for your practice. Sokni says, mindfulness of thought can lead us to experience gaps between thoughts in which we are totally alive, alert and attentive, yet unburdened by the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves, others and the world around us. Did anybody get a moment of that? Just attending to the mind itself without engaging with the content of the mind. That's the real goal. Um, yeah, of this practice. Ironically, I think I say this every week, but it's so strange that being less you makes you happier. And it's not that you're a, a bad person or just bad or any in any way. It's just our over-identification with ourselves. Did, did a Lopan Chandra show up yet on this call? Just looking out there. Does anybody see her? Okay. I will proceed ahead. She will join us shortly. So in talking about creating inner space, one thing that's really important is identifying what's in the way of our inner space. <laughs> and it's, it's I, right? This idea of us. And I want to revisit from chapter four. We're, we're on chapter 11 now. Um, from chapter four, when Sokni really talks about the different ways that we formulate I, a sense of self. Most of us know that there is a, a sense of self, a kind of created concoction of um, who we are established way early back, probably even before we were consciously aware, and that has followed us and gained a lot of momentum along these years of an idea of who we are in comparison to others, both higher and lower, of who we are and we want to be seen in the world. All of these combinations. But what Sokni does, I think, quite beautifully <clears throat> is he tells us about a couple of different versions of I. And I want us to really think about these versions of I and how they, they show up. Oh, welcome, Chandra. Hi, everybody. Good to be hey. here. Um, <clears throat> we just finished practice, and I was going to talk a little bit about the versions of I that get in the way. Great. Um, so he talks about in the beginning that there's this idea of a solid I. He said this I-ness is located vaguely inside of our bodies, in our imagination, and we start to apply labels to it over and over. And this solid I that, that we begin with, actually, it's not, it's not that stable. Um, that we can really understand that version of I as it's not, you know, it's indeed separate from others, but it's not this fully formed I. The solid I he talks about is really a progression from what he describes as the mere I, M-E-R-E. -E. In this practice of mindfulness of thoughts, when we gain a little access to awareness without really having a sense of being caught in our thoughts, that's a little taste of mere I. The mere I is when you know, we're kind of just, um, just a bare approximation of someone who is thinking, someone who is feeling. He said, at near eye, we're able to discern a sense of difference, a distinction between being hungry or being full, whether we are alone or with other people, but it's very light. We're not really fixed on Eve, who prefers to eat organic vegetables from the farmer's market, right? It's not that far along in our identity project. It's just some sense of me being me. He says that we actually start to get in a lot more trouble when we move into the sense of I that he describes as the precious I. And this precious I is idea that we, um, you know, we essentially have an idea of my stories, my wants, my needs. 
And this precious eye is cherished in that we think that it's most important that we attend to that precious eye, that cherished eye. Now, for some of you, you may not feel like you relate to this cherished eye at all, right? You're busy most of the day thinking about the ways that you're not living up to it, that maybe you could be better or improve. And what Sophie clarifies here is that actually this precious or cherishing eye, um, it actually refers to something that is just kind of caught that we're holding on to. And that it can indeed be an, uh, an idea of ourself as flawed. That a self-cherishing eye is an eye that we feel that we are actually loyal to, a sense of self um, that is um, actually flawed. So we can really hold close and dear. We can almost cherish the sense of ourself as not good enough, not smart enough, not pretty enough, not young enough, like whatever. It can evolve over time as we are evolving as well. And one thing he points out with this kind of self-cherishing eye, this eye that gets in the way of us having a fluidity of thoughts that can come and go in the spaciousness of our mind. He says that there's a quality of it that's addictive. He says, maybe a better understanding of precious eye or self-cherishing eye would be addictive eye, an aspect of self that becomes attached to and feels a need for something beyond the basic spark of warmth, openness, and curiosity to experience a sense of connectedness, of familiarity and comfort. So I, I think that it's interesting in that, um, in that framing to think of this precious or self-cherishing eye it's this idea that we become addicted to some sense of ourselves that we, we hope to or believe will make us feel safe and connected from the outside. So I, I really love this term identity project. When we talk about I, that feels to me better than ego, same idea, but this identity project, because I don't know about you all, but I always have a project going on. It's never finished. And there's always this kind of thing in the back of my head about that project. And I need to really just, you know, make the project um, just a little bit farther along and then things will be good. And I think it's interesting when we have this identity project of really kind of placing or putting forth an idea of who we are as the most important thing we work on. Never quite good enough, always in process. And that that indeed can become a real kind of habit and pattern of mind. And when we have that habit and pattern of mind, we are really unavailable to the rest of the world. We really actually can't tell what is happening outside of that identity project. It is just, it's kind of so um, intensely part of it. And Sophie also talks about the social eye. And I think for a lot of us, this is probably um, very relevant. I just mentioned at the very beginning of our time together how important it is that we're in community. And indeed, it's through our relationships that we really learn about where we're stuck. Um, we can learn about what it's like to truly feel engaged and care. But what Sokni says is that the trap of the social eye, he says it's set up for conflict because what we're feeling inside might not be what we're trained to project outside. So if we behave exactly how we think we should, then we end up not feeling connected to the intrinsic nature of who we are. Sometimes this is called a sense of self-alienation. So for any of you who have a job in which you have to show up and present in a certain way, to look happy, to look calm, to look patient, to look interested, right? You're presenting this social eye that really helps you get in touch with and engage with others, but also ends up getting in the way of yourself connected to your deeper being. And when I say deeper being, I'm really, again, interestingly, I'm talking about that sense of spaciousness. So when we think of spaciousness, for most of us, we think of it as this kind of ethereal, out there feeling. And what I love in this chapter is that he really, he talks about it as a complete inner space. Indeed, we can think of the qualities on the outside that can help us understand what it feels like here, um, but actually, what we're really you know, understanding is that the inner space can be cultivated right here through practices, again, not of leaving our own mind or leaving our own body, but noticing what is completely 
and always still, that quality of awareness that is still, and inviting ourselves there. Um, I think what's interesting too about the way that he's kind of framing the ways we can uh, invite ourselves to find spaciousness is through a glimpse. So I said in the meditation instruction that it's possible for us to catch a glimpse of the stillness of our mind amid the thoughts coming and going. Um, and he describes this beautiful story of his father for the first time teaching him this awareness practice, this spacious awareness practice. And he says, I suddenly unquestionably knew that what I was experiencing within my own awareness was free from mental or emotional or physical labels. So then we get in a lot of trouble here as teachers because we're trying to point out something that we don't want you to actually <laughs> have words for. We want to point out something that you just feel that you inhabit its full spaciousness. Um, so I think, I think with that, um, I will shift over to Chandra and we can talk a little bit more about this idea of what it means to create space and other techniques that Sokni presents for finding space through practice. Thank you, that's a great lead in. You know, saying that we are space, the inner and outer space, it can sound really new agey, right? But it's not. I, I looked it up. <laughs> and in a science article, it says that we are, either whether it's a car, a building, our body, us, almost entirely 99.9999999999% empty space. So it's true. So the experience of space is not just a new agey mind trip. And so when we open into this experience of space, both inner and outer space, mixing awareness with space, we've been playing with this in the last few weeks in particular in our meditation. It's not like we go up and out there and leave our body and get disembodied or dissociated in order to mix with, feel, become one with, uh, blend awareness with space, feel and open to that spaciousness within and around us. We don't have to leave our body to go find space. I guess because we say outer space, we tend to think it's out there. I encounter this a lot with meditation students who are just learning this, you know, oh, but I get disembodied and they complain and I'm dissociating. No, you don't have to and actually you're not supposed to. One wonderful technique is to open to a, an experience of spaciousness within yourself, knowing that space is mostly what you are, 99.99999%. I want to read a little bit from a, a, an article here. Um, the size of an atom is governed by the average location of its electrons, okay? So how much space there is between the nucleus at the center and then the atom's amorphous outer shell, the perimeter. So nuclei are around 100,000 times smaller than the atoms they're housed in. If the nucleus were the size of a peanut, the atom would be about the size of a baseball stadium. If we lost all the dead space inside our atoms in our body, we would each be able to fit into a particle of dust. <laughs> and the entire human species would fit into the volume of a sugar cube. <laughs> Does that blow your mind? I can share the link to this article. Then it goes on and on and talks about, well, where does all of our mass come from? And then he goes into energy, quarks, and that's brilliant. But I'm not going to go into all of that. I'll, I'll, when it's Eve's turn to talk, I'll cut and paste the link into the chat function. Okay, so I feel really uh, vindicated because for years I've been talking about space, but I haven't taken the time to go back to my biology or physics and really and really reread over what I know is true. And of course, even I have studied for years with the the physics 
guru uh, in the Buddhist world who is Alan Wallace. I mean, he is <clears throat> he's all about the nature of reality, quantum physics, nature of mind. I mean, that's his thing. So if you sit with him, you're going to absorb even a little bit, if, if not a lot of that. And so space is a really um, important aspect of, of course, reality, as I've said here, but also of meditation practice. Because relaxation is very important. Of course, if you don't have relaxation and meditation, it can get uncomfortable. It's not very fun. <laughs> and you're not going to get very far. You know what I mean? But also space is important. So relaxing into a sense of space or spaciousness is very key, especially when it comes to this style of practice that Sokni Rinpoche is teaching called Dzogchen. So in chapter 11, he has a nice section about Dzogchen, and so I'd like to share a little bit about that. Um, on page 185, he talks about um, being with his father. You know, if you're reading the book, it's very sweet. He's sharing stories about his strict tulku or monastic education that is causing him a lot of sorrow, actually, <laughs> and actually making him physically ill. He later derobes because he doesn't want to be a monastic. It's not for him. But in the meantime, he gets to have these glimpses of another way, another way of training, another way of practicing when he gets to visit his father, Toku Urgen, and we've spoken a bit about him in the past. A very magical, beautiful Dzogchen teacher, one of the one of the key uh, Dharma teachers, Tibetan Buddhist teachers, to come out during the diaspora in the 50s and 60s and teach the budding, globe-trotting, um, acid-taking <laughs> Dharma students from the West, right? So he was a very formative teacher for a lot of the first wave of generation of, of Western Dharma students. And so his father was very, very, a very powerful figure. And so he got to study with him occasionally. And I actually went to his monastery called Nagi Gompa. I don't know if you've been there, Eve. Maybe other people have been there. It's actually a nunnery in Nepal, just, um, I think it's north of Kathmandu, right in the mountains, the foothills of the Himalayas there. And he had a wonderful little studio that was built like a single room studio that was his meditation room on the very top floor of the of the nunnery. So you had the nunnery was maybe three or four stories high and then the top floor was a nice big flat patio and then he had this single room there. And now, you know, he passed away many years ago, but if you go do pilgrimage to the nunnery, you can go up there and be accompanied by a resident nun who will make sure you don't, like, you know, uh, steal anything because they've left all of his books, his ritual items, his cushions, his meditation seat, all as they were when he died. So I meditated in this room that Sokni Rinpoche is talking about receiving Dzogchen teachings from his father in. So that was a nostalgic for me. I actually have a photo that I might share or give to um, Katie so we can put it on Instagram of this beautiful room. So what is Dzogchen? Because this is really an important, um, uh, it's called Ati Yoga, which means the pinnacle yoga practice within Tibetan Buddhism. It's really considered to be the peak of the mountaintop of Dharma from the within the Buddhist uh, practices. All the different lineages respect it and view it as, as in a very important, if not the most important teaching. So dzok means great, I mean dzok means complete or perfect and it's short for dzokpa and then chen means great or vast and it's short for Chen Po. So you may hear Dzog Pa Chen Po, and that is shortened to just Dzog Chen. Same thing. It means the great perfection, or the great completion, or the vast perfection. And we'll go into that in a moment. 
And what that means is that not like even Eve was talking about, we have the small self-identity, which is trying to be perfect all the time, which is utterly useless and impossible. So we might as well just give, give up and have some fun, right? So it's not about that kind of perfection. What Zolk means in this context is that, it is that it's already complete in and of itself. That everything is already perfect, just like your own true nature of mind is already perfect. It's not solid or bad. You don't have to improve upon it. You are naturally, naturally pure from the very beginning and perfect as you are. Nothing is left out, he says. And then he goes into, on the bottom of page 85, describing, like for example, if you, you're sitting in your room and you look out your window, you only see a wall or a tree or a piece of the street. But then you go out of your apartment or your house and you see more. And then you go to the park and you see more. You go to the ocean, you see a bigger view. It's that kind of opening up your view of who you actually truly are. And what he says at the top of page 186, in a way, that movement into wider and more open spaces reflects the Chen in Dzogchen, the great or vast aspect of Dzogchen. And on a more personal level, Chen may also reflect the sense of exhilaration one feels after walking out of a tiny room with a tiny window and seeing for the first time a much broader scene, a sense that this is amazing. And then, so he goes on to, I want to read this wonderful account of his, uh, another, this uh, maybe second teaching he receives from his father in that wonderful little atrium meditation room at Nagi Gompa, where he confides in his father how he's been feeling weighted down by feelings of being a bad toku. You know, oh, a tulku shouldn't be depressed, a tulku shouldn't have desire for women, a tulku shouldn't be breaking out in hives and thinking he's horrible, <laughs> you know. So he wanted to find his life before he was given this title that gave, put so much responsibility on his shoulders, and he was struggling. So he's sitting there with his father and he writes, We were sitting alone together in his small room during the daytime. Through his window, I could see clouds forming, floating and dissolving into different shapes in the sky. Look at the clouds, Toku Urgen said. His father said, are they good or bad? I shook my head and tried to best answer, well, they may be good for some people because it gives them shelter from the sun. But maybe some people might think they're bad because it might mean rain, which will make them uncomfortable and maybe pour down too much water on the crops they're growing. Exactly, he replied, smiling. I waited. Good, bad, happy, sad, these are relatively true qualities, depending on people's circumstances, he said. But they aren't absolutely, intrinsically true qualities. On an absolute level, they're just labels for experience, which the mind creates and which we cling to as part of ourselves and our experiences. They aren't good or bad in themselves. They're like clouds floating through space. The problem, he continued, is our tendency to believe wholeheartedly in those labels, which is like trying to hold clouds in space or wishing they would go away. We want to change or hold on to the conditions or circumstances, but that only makes the problem worse because we see these conditions as permanent and intrinsically real, rather than as temporary manifestations of causes and conditions. As I listened to him, I glanced out the window and saw that indeed the clouds were moving, changing shape, some of them dissipating altogether. He noticed my glance and murmured, Yes, look how they're changing. But the space beyond them hasn't changed at all. That space is like your essential nature. It doesn't change. It doesn't have a beginning or an end. 
just as clouds pass through the sky, sometimes covering it completely. Space is always there in our hearts, in our minds, in all of our experience. And he smiled encouragingly, and it goes on. But that gets to the point of space here, that the clouds, like our thoughts, arise and dissolve within that space of the mind. And that mind is always present. It's almost too easy, so we miss it. It's like the air we breathe. And so I imagine that in the meditation that Eve guided you in, you started to touch into that quality of the space of the mind and observing thoughts arise and pass within that space of the mind, settling the mind in its natural state. And it's a very, um, it's a very healing experience to open to. It's like coming home. It's like being able to put down this heavy load of the eye eye maker project. It's called Ahankara, the eye maker. And the Hindu tradition, they talk about it a lot too. And it's, it's a form of our makeup, is this eye making project. It's, it's for, for various reasons, we were made to do that. So it's not bad. But getting free and talking about liberation is about being able to have some space or at least recognize the space that's already between you and each thought, within you, within each thought. And then you're not imprisoned by thought anymore. And that is liberation, right here in the palm of your hand, in each moment. Each moment we can do that right now. Open into spacious presence. We can witness thought, we can bring the heartbreak home, we can hold our tender, tantruming child. We can do all of that, but we can also do it better with that capacity to hold all of it like the arms of the great loving mother, which is space. And that's Prajnaparamita too, the great mother, is that very thing that wisdom, that experience that can hold all of it, the beautiful and the horrible, within that vast, spacious presence, awareness, and recognizing that that is the ground of your own being. Everything goes better with space, as one of our mentors likes to say, uh, Jennifer Wellwood. Everything goes better with space. I love that. I always think that. Everything, whether it's relationship, conversation, teaching, practice, walking, sex, <laughs> everything goes better with space, spaciousness. Try it if you haven't already. Um. Thank you, Chandra. I think it would be, uh, we'd love to see if there's questions for now. Um, we've already covered a lot and, and meditation. There's two other um, suggestions that he makes for actually for finding space that are really one quite simple, this kind of method of dropping, um, uh, which we can, we can try together. It's, it's kind of deceivingly simple. Um, and then we can also really just, as we are together, see if we can kind of surface what Chandra so beautifully said, which is the space that's already here already here, no need to generate it. Um, but it would be great to hear questions from folks. Um, please maybe raise your hand if that's possible. Um, and if you could do so on the participant list, then we can really see everybody um, and call on you and hear you. So if you go to the bottom where it says participants, you could see yourself, you highlight yourself and you can raise your hand, I believe, mm -hmm. can you? Can people do that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any questions on space or comments on experiences of space? Yes, Katie. Um, so Chandra, you mentioned that you don't need to sort of go like up and out to mm -hmm. find space. And I noticed that I, 
try to do that a lot. That feels like my, my move is that spaciousness is kind of like above and behind my head somewhere. And I'm wondering if you have advice for kind of counteracting that move or what to do instead. Yeah, yeah. Feel your body, breathe into your body. And as you breathe, feel it oxygenating all the cells and the space within you. I like to do that. So it's very much an embodied experience. So feel the vibration of space within you. And it, in a way, touching into space probably can be accessed through the subtle body, right? The energy body that we've been touching in on. In a way, energy lives within the space of the body, within the space of the cells. And so by by feeling the energy in the body, we can also then open into the space that surrounds and permeates that energy. So feeling your feet on the floor, feeling your body in space, feeling uh, the breath traveling through the spacious caverns of the body. And then also for me, first-hand experience, relaxation. Mm -hmm. Relaxation helps to open into a quality of more spaciousness. So for example, if you tend to grind your teeth or hold your tension somewhere in the body, breathing in, bringing the breath and awareness into that area, wherever it might be. Mm -hmm. Wait, let's try it right now. Everybody, like where do you hold your, where do you hold the weight of the world? <laughs> so wherever that is, feel it. And then now let's exhale fully. And then with your next in breath, Breathe breath and awareness into that area that might feel constricted or tense or heavy. And feel that, that space expanding. And then with the out breath, let go. Mm. Drop it. That's an aspect of the dropping. And then open into that feeling of more spaciousness within you. This that simple practice with the breath can help. And then you experience space permeating you and all, all around you. So it gets really beautiful in the sense where you're just like a little ball of dough <laughs> in the big, vast space. And that that space is permeating and pervading you and pervading everything else. So it is out there, but it's also in here, both. I love that you're pointing out, Chandra, too, just the paradox of that, that by actually attending and turning towards what feels tight and constricted, there is openness. And, and part of that has to do with we are unaware of the low level of suppression that is needed to support this identity project at all times. All the things we have to push down and avoid in order to push forward what needs to be there. And we attend to it, with this, as you said, this gentleness. And I think the other aspect of space that sometimes gets confused is that it's aloof. And I love how he always says spaciousness, warmth, and curiosity. Mm. We would never want to have one of those qualities without the other. Yeah, thank you. I see Paul and then Eric uh, hands. Paul, uh, hey. Thomas, yeah. Yeah, I've been a massage therapist for over 20 years, and my intention with most sessions was to make more space in the body. Mm. People don't realize how compressed they get just in daily life by things that happen and pressure we put on ourselves. And you get used to that day after day after day. So to make a little space in a person's body was a very rewarding thing for them and me as a practitioner mm. and difference was noticeable immediately people yeah. tend to relax take that deep breath and a sigh and whatever and of course the time just flies during those sessions and then they're ready to go out and do whatever comes up next so mm. making space in a body in the mm. inner body is uh, always a good thing. Mm. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. There is no separation <laughs> in my mind and body, right? That's right. It's all connected. Thank you for reminding us of that. Yeah. Let's see, uh, Eric? <clears throat> Hi. Thank you, guys. I'm, uh, this is my first time joining your Sangha. And I'm thrilled uh, this the subject matter. Um, 
So uh, I've been practicing for three years, but mostly in the four foundations of mindfulness. And most of my teachers, that's kind of their primary thing where, where you know, there, there is spacious awareness involved, but it's much more like, you know, the concentrated effort of the breath, body, you know, feeling tone. But I've been mesmerized by, you know, the, the less dual Dzogchen practices, but I haven't really been able to sit with the teacher. Um, so I've kind of just been doing it, you know, on my own through the teachings that I find like, you know, online and whatnot. <clears throat> and obviously there's a lot of uh, uh, interesting things that come along. So what in one practice usually start sort of with, as you led the meditation kind of with like the foundations of mindfulness and then try to ease in uh, using that energy body, that sense of the energy body, um, and, and begin to try to let go the conceptual nature of it and just feel it as like, you know, a, a energy arising within spaciousness. And then what's worked for me somewhat has been to like try to, to, to then know, notice where the bins, it's like kind of using that as like a, an access point or whatever. And, and it used to feel very centered, but over time it's kind of loosened up, like where it's less centered, there's still a sense of the body, but it used to literally be like, I am watching my body. And now it's more like the bodies are rising. I guess where what, what, what I'm curious about something is, you know, words are so imperfect, like acquainted with spaciousness, but then the conceptual mind begins to build the concept of spaciousness. Mm -hmm. Does that kind of make sense? Like, then I begin to conceptualize what spaciousness is. And I don't know, like, you know, if there's like, the way that I've tried to reset is like, just like, well, just experience it and don't, put more labels on top of it but hmm. wonder if you have any other tip trick yeah um Chandra I'd love to hear what you have to say I'm just going to give Alan's uh, uh, internal uh, answer oh sorry Eric you were breaking up just a tiny bit but I think I, we got the question um of how to not conceptualize space once you've started to familiarize with space um and you um, haven't been here before, so you won't hear that Alan Wallace, who's a, a teacher that Chandra and I have both spent a lot of time with, I'd say 85% of his response to all questions, he is like a, a Dzogchen master. <laughs> and I would highly recommend uh, Wisdom Publications has four or five of his full Dzogchen courses. Mm. And they are all based on um, very traditional teachings. And if you like uh, scholarly approaches, you will love that and his his instructions are precise. Um, I, I hate to cut you off, but yeah. uh, you cut out right when you were saying, were you, did you say B. Allen Wallace? Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Chandra and I have both studied, but the majority of his responses to most questions is relax. Yeah. And not just like cognitively, right? But having the sense of relaxing back into. So that's what I would offer as another move. Hmm. Absolutely, that's beautiful. It's it's it can't it, the, the, it's, as long as you're labeling and thinking it, you're not in it. So that is, if you know that, then you're like, oh, there, I'm doing it again. <laughs> Drop it, relax, and open into that visceral somatic experience of space. It's mm -hmm. very healing, and you know it. We all know it. What that is. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. Welcome. Thank yeah. You. Thanks, Eric. And uh, Donna. Hi, um, I was, how are you doing? <laughs> Thanks, really glad to be here. Um, I was just thinking, you know, um, when, when I meditate um, a lot, um, I feel like my, I lose a uh, connection to my verbal center. It's not really about words at all. Um, and that the words really, when I, when I try to verbalize, like, uh, it is really imprecise. So 
I'm wondering, I mean, for me, like I've just really been trying to simplify. Um, and what you were saying about relaxing is really good instruction. Um, and then like uh, what Chandra was saying about going towards the tenseness. I mm -hmm. guess I'm, I'm just trying to simplify my practice so I'm not in my head and trying to churn about all these words and stuff and focus on my individual freedom, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. I, I think I, um, I'm just trying to be in my body. <laughs> um, okay. Yes. <laughs> Can you comment or talk about that? <laughs> So it's so it's such a it's such a balance. We are so blessed with so many teachings and teachers, all of us, in this time that we live in, with access to the internet, um, and we can become, um, you know, inadvertently spiritual materialists, right? Just so many teachings, so many practices, so many empowerments, um, and we are losing that more kind of intimate sense with our experience of our practice. And so I just really honor you in um, exploring that for yourself. Yeah, right now it's not time to achieve a bunch of new great heights. It's time to rest and replenish and stabilize and be gentle with ourselves. I think that a lot of people are coming at this time in quarantine, uh, perhaps in different ways. Obviously everybody's different. But if you tend to be driven by ambition or goals, whether it's spiritual ambition or other goals, maybe check in on that and, and also use this time to um, try something different, to relax, to be in the body. And uh, it's true, it's very important. You know, the I mentioned Prajnaparamita earlier, the great perfection really is that. Prajna means wisdom, paramita means perfection, so the perfection of wisdom is another way of understanding the nature of mind, our interdependent, empty nature, and also the vast space within which all phenomena arise and pass away. And the direct, unmediated moment of loving union with that experience is not to be thought. We mm. can't think our way there. Mm. So mm. one thing that helps me is to come up with a couple yes thought, like sayings. So, if you're trying to be in your body, you can open into space and do whatever practice you're doing. And then if you notice you're lost in thought, just repeat to yourself that saying that means something to you. Mm. Like, relax, or I'm in my body, or I'm present with my breath. Whatever it is, if it means something to you, it can be your mm. mantra, your stabilizing shamatha anchor to bring you back into your body. And then release the thought. So it's a th you're using thought to bring thought back home, and then you can consciously relax and release it. Like uh, Alan taught me, you know, rest, settle the mind in its natural state, free of distraction, free of grasping. I say that over and over and over to myself. I've done it for 20 years and it works. Mm -hmm. It helps me. So find yours. Mm. I want to just make a, a comment um, and then take a question from Sammy who's been who's been waiting here now but um, it can feel a bit um, luxurious or even tone deaf to consider practicing space when the world needs so much compassion. Um, and I, I really want to speak to that. I, I actually was relieved that we were speaking on space this week because I think without some of this capacity for us to find space, our compassion will wear us out. Our compassion will feel overwhelming. And you know, sometimes we can think of an equanimity practice as a practice that helps us create space. And there's a really important kind of wisdom and knowledge around these four immeasurable practices of compassion, loving kindness, empathetic joy, and equanimity. We can't just choose one. And I think for many of us, compassion is so important and so needed right now, and we know that. But if that's where we are, if that's where we wake up, if that's where we spend our day, if that's where we go to sleep, we will feel exhausted and depleted. So the spaciousness practice is not just for its uh, qualities of providing us some vividness and some clarity. It's just 
wow, it is such a powerful ally, I would say, for our compassion. Um, and yeah, Chandra, I'd be, I wonder your thoughts on, um, yeah, I'm sure the, the folks that you're working with as well around this, what people call compassion fatigue, but it's truly just empathic distress and you know, mm -hmm. stuck within. Yeah, I mean, wisdom, this part, wisdom into emptiness, this spacious awareness is always balanced with compassion. It, it's, it's, the compassion and wisdom are said to be the two wings of the bird mm. of enlightenment. So right on, on bringing that up. Yeah, because the theme of this chapter wasn't compassion. We were more focusing on the theme, which is space. But we should never forget how important that is. But yes, finding a balance, not getting empathy fatigue. Another one-liner mantra that has served me for all these years is manifest and take a rest. Mm. Manifest, then take a rest. Mm. So the manifest would be compassion in action. Go out, protest. And in French, the word for protest is manifestation. Mm. To manifest, to come out and manifest your voice. And then we have to rest and replenish. And all of the racial justice educators that I'm studying with say that time to rest everybody okay do your work and now let's take a rest did you rest because it is exhausting if we're always always putting out and we have to learn that it's not linear it's circular we have to rest find the space find the relaxation and know that we we can do that and we deserve that mm -hmm. so that we could then be of greater benefit when we go out and manifest again whatever it is we're doing mm -hmm. wonderful Sammy has a question and he's been patiently waiting and I will attend to the chat here also. Yeah, hi. Um, I just want to, you know, I just wanted to uh, say in reference to what you guys were saying, you know, this creating of the space and, you know, when you, the more you accept this idea of no self in your life, I know just speaking for me, when we, last year we we're talking about the way of the Bodhisattva, when there would be something in the path that would be asked of me that I would feel like, well, I, I could never do that. I don't know what this is like. You'd always fall back on, well, there is no self. So I, I can't really use that excuse. And uh, <laughs> that would help me kind of just do whatever it is that I need to do on the path and to, you know, follow that regard and feel into the feeling regardless of what it is, not expecting some kind of feeling in return. Um, and, my question was just to ask, uh, you know, I definitely hesitate to ask about this because I hear the, uh, you know, when you ask for clarification on this idea of space, what can happen is you go to the meditation and then you're seeking evidence of whatever that clarification is, whatever the teacher suggests, you're then looking to find that and then not really being open to just what is there. Um, but when we did the meditation today, and I think we've done this recently, where um, we're asked to open our eyes. And, um, you know, what I experience in that is that what I see um, or hear or feel exists in the same space, if you will, as the thoughts. And that, that it's all within that consciousness. And then I really appreciated the practice of being asked to lean, lean back in your mind, that, that leaning back in your mind so that when you're in, you know, seeing what comes up in the consciousness and then leaning back to kind of just, you know, it's kind of like, um, like if you're standing at a river and you just sort of step leaning back to take in the whole picture of the river with the land and the sky and everything. You know, um, I don't know, that was my experience. I just wanted to clarify that that is kind of the point of opening the eyes in the meditation. Thank you. It's interesting that that he, that Sokhni Rinpoche chose to really focus on space in this chapter, which is the fourth foundation of mindfulness, mindfulness of phenomena. Because I've always learned it as, oh, mindfulness of all the phenomena, the perceptions that come in through the five, six perceptions of the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the ears, touch, and then the mind is the sixth sense in Buddhism. And so, yes, it, that is kind of more the sutric or early uh, traditional way of learning to be mindful of phenomena. 
But you're right, um, Sammy and Eric, in the sense of bringing up this topic of the four foundations, is that in this chapter he's talking about, he brilliantly focuses on space because space is the space within which all phenomena arise to us, whether it's outer things, sights, sounds, um, visual uh, field uh, coming into our awareness, and that's the space of phenomena there. And also the space of the mind within which all of those are perceived, good, bad, large, small, labeling. But then he's touching into space as not just the space of the mind, but the space of the mind, meaning Rigpa, mm -hmm. which is pristine awareness, which is the ground of being and our ultimate nature, our basic goodness. Mm, yeah, so, and then being able to turn, turn, normally our senses are projecting outwards. Eve, do you think it's a good time to do the, the drop thing? Yeah, yeah, that's, that would be okay. a good thing. Finishing okay. up. Yeah. All right. yeah, so we have just a few minutes so we can end with this. So let's end with an experience, right? We talk, 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 it's great. And now we get to integrate through experience. So let's kind of, you know, sit up nice and comfortably tall. And uh, you can rest the gaze at a comfortable angle. So the, the gaze is open, gazing downward, but soften the gaze. Don't stare, but soften. Relax the muscles around the eyes and connect with this feeling of the space that is all around you and the space that pervades you, the phenomena that appear to the eyes, the other senses, the mind within this space. This is the fourth foundation of mindfulness. Mindfulness of dharma, of space, of all phenomena, so rest in that for a moment, just breathe and release any tension with the out-breath, come home to the body. And now allow yourself to simply be aware of whatever it is you're aware of. So open into that quality of awareness. Maybe it's sound, a smell, a thought, or sensation. And then turn your attention inward. The way that Sokni Rinpoche's father had turned his hands. You can even do it where the palm is outward, this is your awareness, then turn your palm inward as if you're turning awareness back in upon itself and become aware of what is aware of that sound, smell, thought, or sensation. Allow yourself to become aware of and alert to the momentary gaps between physical sensations, feelings, and thoughts. And turn your attention to the space between these clouds of experience. By doing this, you may catch a glimpse of the fact that there's no separation, no distinction between the experiences and what is being experienced. And rest in that glimpse. Might not last for long. Don't worry, in the beginning it's that way for many of us. And you can repeat the exercise of turning towards, becoming aware of whatever you're aware of, and then turn your attention inward.
the feeling is that you, you rest, become aware of whatever it is you're aware of. Are you thinking? Are you tired? Then turn and become aware of that. Who is looking? Turn awareness to look at awareness and then drop. So you can let the hand drop like Toko Organ did. You can turn the palm, look, and then to drop and rest in the afterglow, the after effect of that looking and releasing. Did you experience any gaps, any space between the clouds of thought? So releasing is very important in this. They say it's like a bundle of straw whose the bundling string is cut loose and the straw drops. So the feeling of letting go of the ahankara, the eye project, the thinking is like that dropping and resting. Turn, look, and release. And rest in spaciousness. So you can do that throughout your day. It doesn't take a long time. You can pepper your day with a few minutes here and there, even in the moment, waiting at the red light in your car, instead of being angry that you're at a red light or frustrated or impatient or bored, use it as a mindfulness bell. Turn, look, release. And rest. And then when it turns green, go. <laughs> Don't get too spaced out. So we're working on spaciousness, spaciousness, not spaciness. We don't want to train in spacey people. Thank you. Eve, you want to bring us home? Mm, thank you. Yes, let's take a moment to dedicate a um, really beautiful conversation with you all and investigations. So subtle. Um, so let's take a moment to gather in and really feel the sense and benefit of our connection of being here together, being here with one another. And in our dedication, we really put forward that heartfelt aspiration that this work we're doing, these investigations are not only for our own benefit, but they could radiate out in all directions, serving to be of benefit for all beings that all beings would know their true nature as space, as warmth, as curiosity, that all beings would feel the freedom of that true nature, and that all beings would feel a sense of belonging and connection. May we all be free. Thank you all. Take care of yourselves. Take care, be gentle. And then feed your demons next week. Yeah? Yeah. Very good way to take care of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody. It was a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Eve, yeah. for all of your sharing and for holding the beginning of the class so I could have dinner with my 20 year old daughter who's driving back to college tomorrow. So I'm glad I got to be with you all and share in this Ati Yoga. <laughs> and uh, there, there are other ways to, to learn more with, um, you know, authentic uh, teachers of Ati Yoga. It's a very, very beautiful teaching. 
There are teachers, more Western style teachers, who will give it in a more open way. And then there's the traditional way that is also very beautiful. And if you ever have the opportunity to do it in that way, uh, with the Tibetan Lama usually, uh, I would highly recommend it because really Dzogchen begins with an, a mind ripening empowerment called the Rigpa Tselwang. Uh, Rigpa is pr pristine awareness. Tsel, tsel is the effulgence or the ripening. Wang is empowerment. And it's a beautiful ceremony, a ritual, where the, the teacher um, gives pointing out instructions that open you to the nature of your own rigpa so that it can ripen and blossom. Mm -hmm. And so traditionally it's said that Dzogchen needs to be practiced with that rigpa tsel wang. And, uh, but having said that, it doesn't mean you can't study with others who don't necessarily give that to traditional empowerment. You can begin to approach the practice and open to it, because having said that, it's all already here and present. <laughs> but there's a lot of deep, 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 beautiful poetry within that, so. I don't know, I can't recommend particular names right now. Um, it's too bad Galtro, Galtro Rinpoche isn't teaching so much anymore, right, Eve? Yeah, um, so, so many, I received pointing out instructions from him three times. He does it in the Bay Area every year. So if he comes to the Bay Area. There yeah, you go. Hopefully he will come back. He's in April every year in Mount Madonna. So yeah, hopefully. look him up. Yeah. Yeah. Good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs> we have two quick announcements from the collective. Um, one is that uh, Chandra is doing a webcast this Saturday, um, and there's a link to that in the chat, and she'll be guiding three different practices. Um, so click through that link for more information about that. And then in the spirit of, as Chandra mentioned before, of resting and manifesting, and bringing spaciousness to the way that we are in the world. We're starting a series at the Dharma Collective on Tuesday nights, um, starting next Tuesday. And it's all different Dharma Collective teachers answering the question, how can we as meditators meet this unprecedented moment that we're in? Um, we know we can't just go inward forever and bypass. Um, we also know we can't just go outward without doing the inner work ourselves. And so for the next um, number of weeks, we have a different teacher each week answering that question. Um, and so there's a link to that in the chat. Um, and you can click through that link and you can see the first four classes are available now. You have to register uh, for them. So register for any that you'd like to. And then keep an eye on that page because we'll be announcing more. Uh, over the next few weeks. And then I'll hand it off to Mace and Pamela to say a couple of things about Donna. Hi everyone, I'm Mace. I know it's super late, so I'm just gonna say, I think you all know this, that the center is run on donations. And I was thinking about a lot of what people put in the chat box tonight when Eve asked us how we were. Um, and there was a lot of like heavy feelings. The world feels hard in a lot of ways and so it really feels like it is i'm so grateful to have this sangha to come to and the other sanghas with the dharma collective and I'm so grateful that we have teachers that can teach and <clears throat> one of the ways we can keep both of those things happening is to give as much as we're able um and katie put some links in the chat for the paypal and there's a venmo address whatever you call that um so that's the Donna talk for tonight. And it's lovely to be with you all. Thank you.